Tim, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us started and then hand okay. it off to you. We're at almost five after the hour. Uh, welcome to uh, TSI's webinar from Fiction to Function, Real World AI Transformation and Security. That's a lot to say on one breath. <laughs> Um, this is a, a part of a series that we're doing in terms of webinars, but this one, today's webinar is going to be a little different. Typically, what we've done is come up with a uh, challenge that's happening in the security industry and then had one of our vendor partners come in and discuss one of the solutions to that. Um, today's a bit more um, a bit more eggheaded than that. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, a series of questions that people are facing in terms of how AI is affecting the security industry. And we have have uh, two subject matter experts here today that are just full of knowledge and Tim's going to go through these questions with them and then at the end we're going to have time for you guys to ask questions as well. So our goal today is to demystify uh, what's happening with AI and security. So with that being said, Tim, I will hand it off to you. You're muted, my friend. Auspicious beginning. Um, yeah. <laughs> so welcome pitch. everyone. Thank you for uh, for attending this uh, this tech talk this morning, and we're very uh, very pleased and honored to have, as David said, two really strong subject subject matter experts in this uh, in this field. And so our uh, our first one that we're going to introduce is uh, Boris Plow. Um, he was the founder of Calypsa, which is the groundbreaking AI cloud based monitoring software for video surveillance, um, which Calypsa, there's, you can read his bio, and uh, Calypsa was sold to Motorola Solutions, and uh, thankfully Boris stayed with him, and he's the head of AI at Motorola Solutions, which is a uh, $1.5 billion business, and uh, he's uh, extremely knowledgeable. Uh, along with Boris, we have uh, my good friend Pierre Bourgex. Pierre, Pierre is a uh, consultant and he has a long history in the security industry going back to uh, ADT, high security. Um, he does a lot of work internationally with his uh, consulting firm. And uh, he has a, a wonderful presenter and uh, subject matter expert on this topic. So we're going to kick things off. If, uh, if, uh, if you two want to say anything, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I'll just get right into our, uh, our first question. So Great. it's it's uh, it's it's one question, but it's really kind of three. So uh, Boris, let me start with you. So, what is AI really, and uh, how does it actually work in practice? Well, AI is, has become quite popular nowadays. Uh, everyone's talking about it. Everyone has is reading about it, and there's a huge buzz around those two letters, AI. Uh, AI is not new. AI has been around for forty years. Uh, and and it comes in waves, you know. Um, Ten years ago, there was all about computer vision. Now it's about generative AI. In the middle of it, there was the chess, uh, you know, AlphaGo. And and every time there's a breakthrough, there's a lot of attention on AI. But what is AI? AI is to make it very simple. It's just fancy statistics. It's it's all about. I have a bunch of data. I'm building a model, and that model helps me to predict the next thing, to generate the next thing, or to classify the next thing. That's what it is, essentially. But obviously, it's a lot more complicated than this, and there is a whole bunch of architectures and, and methodologies and techniques applied to it. But the core essence is, is just statistics applied to the real world. So, uh, uh, Pierre, you want to uh, uh, weigh in and talk a little bit about it and uh, maybe how it yes. works in practice? Yes, the mysticism of AI. Um, <laughs> you know, the, it is a mystical thing. Um, it was, uh, you know, derived, obviously, uh, through the wonderful gentleman, and I would say gentleman at that time and, at IBM. And the marketing was fantastic because it really was based upon data and big data and the whole generative concept came in much later on based on how to use data um the whole purpose obviously is the the genesis of thinking can something else think right can it can it be programmed to do what it wants you, you want it to do and use mathematics and equations to inevitably get to a result 
machine learning, deep learning, these are all, you know, when we talk about the concept of AI, it's, it's grown from that very beginning. And taking all that data and becoming useful to the human being uh, was the chif- difficult piece. And I think the, the other difficult piece was ingestion. How do, you, how do you amass that data? How do you classify that data? How do you, how do you organize that data? And that's really, you know, the beginning of it. And, and from the IT perspective, you know, I, if I if I put on my IT hat and my 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 world that I've lived in for many years is the fact that that was the challenge and if initially because people really didn't know where data resided in their own organization, so therefore they couldn't use it. Uh, practically, it was really po- point in place. It was how do we really make our organization better using the data we have. So that's really, at the end of the day, the most important piece of this, because that's where it began. It began from a business perspective, not as much anything else, but it began to be very, you know, uh, important to our industry because we started realizing, oh, video, wow, thousands and um, thousands of petabytes and terabytes that we could use to finally make something make sense. So, you know, AI is, 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 is truly you know, in regards to what it is, 90% of it today, until you get into the NVIDIA Metropolis environment and and, and Open Vino and the uh, Intel world, it truly is machine learning and deep learning, and then translates into neural network, which we can all we're going to be discussing a little bit of. Let me uh, go back to something you said a moment ago. You asked um, a rhetorical question, I guess, but is it secure? And can you just um, can you address that for a moment? Because that's always front of mind here with uh, well, people in the security space. Well, I think the challenge really is the fact that is your data secure? Is the ingestion point and the information that you're receiving secure? Um, it, it really, you know, we talk about AI. It's a it's the it's the it's the the back end of something that started with you, right? And then when we deal with data that's say flawed or potentially breached or has vulnerabilities it becomes a very, you know, dangerous, slippery slope. So the key is, you know, do you ingest data securely? Is your infrastructure structured to, to ingest that data and store that data securely? And no, the answer is not, I use AWS or Azure, and that's going to make me secure. Because at the end of the day, it's got to go from where you, where you are to where it goes. That's called data at rest and data at transit. And if you don't secure that, then yes, you're unsecure. So yes, that could could it be a dangerous slippery slope? It already has. So that's another thing we should discuss. Yeah, that's a topic of another webinar. Actually, we're going to bring you back uh, specifically to talk about the security of the data. So <clears throat> nice teaser. Uh, <laughs> so did we answer the question of the different AI architectures? No, not yet. Not even close. Okay. Boris, do you want to ha- tackle that? Because listen, I know Boris, and I know what he's doing at, at Motorola. So he's he's a he's a, he's an awesome character over there, done it, doing a great job. Thank you, thank you, Pierre. Um, yeah, great teaser on security. There's a whole discussion that we can have around security and AI, and and you you address the key points very very well. Um, about AI architecture, there's different things that we can talk about. There is how you architect a neural network. There is how you deploy a neural network. And how do you basically solve the end-to-end solutions? You know, how does your data go from A to B? And should you process everything at the edge or, or on the server or in the cloud? There's a whole different directions this conversation can go. But it all starts from a business perspective. What are you trying to achieve? If we take, and we were talking about the video space, we're trying to analyze videos. You, you, you essentially, and at the moment, try to either detect something. It could be a person, it could be a vehicle, it could be a firearm, depending on the use cases, or it could be an action. It could be crowd forming. It could be, um, it could be uh, uh, loitering. It could be, it could be all sorts of different things. And based on what you're trying to achieve, you're going to architect a solution that fits that needs. 
um, there's different sort of AI. You know, you have the vision, you have languages, you have audio, you have different things. Uh, uh, on the language space, you, you, you can have a gigantic model that sort of does everything. That's what we started to have last year with the chat GPT. Video, we're not there yet. Video, you really have to have specialized neural network to do specialized things. You can have some transfer learning, some, some things that are good at getting people can also be used differently. But ultimately, when you design a solution, you really have to think about what you're trying to achieve, <coughs> what sort of accuracy you're trying to expect from it, and what sort of data you can accumulate or gather from, from the field. And then once you understand the scope, once you understand what the, the end users is expecting from, 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 from the algorithm, then you can try to plan ahead. Going into the details, you have the different models. You have what Pierre mentioned, you have some deep learning models. Those are the very popular. And if you think about what it is, it's just basically abstract the data in a way to understand what it means and differentiates the people from the car and the car from the, from the dogs. When you're building the abstraction, you, you, you're essentially creating a black box. Because now it's all about statistics, it's all about probability, which means that when you're detecting a person, you're not really detecting a person. You're associating a probability to a person. I'm seeing a person with a 95 or 96% accuracy, with a confidence of 96%, which means that now you have a trade-off. You can have some false positives and some false negatives. And the good news is most of the manufacturers out there will try to reduce the misses, which means that you don't want to miss anything. If there is a gun, you would prefer to add more false positive, most false positive, make sure that you show more than not showing the gun at all. So I'm sure Pierre will, uh, will show some. Yeah. No, no, I know perfect. we'll talk about that at the end about the let me, false alarm. Let me, add, so. let me add two things to this, just so it's important. So just think about this as one thing, model versus platform, okay? Edge, right? So when we talk about edge or we talk about, so in, in um, uh, intelligence or neural network at the edge, that could be in effect a point solution. Basically, it's just a model that you have on a camera. It could be a Hanwha camera, it could be an access camera that you set preset models that are on a chipset. That helps kind of, oh, I get it. So you can put that, right on the camera and you can give preset conditions. Then there's, of course, the platform, right? And then you have modeling that has been created. Look, NVIDIA is a great example in Metropolis. Those models, okay, need compute. That's a completely different version of point solutions or edge solutions that end up basically giving you the answers or at least defining critical versus non-critical right on the camera edge which doesn't have very much compute power. It just has enough compute power to run the algorithms for specifically the models that you have preconditioned to, to find. And that's very different than I want to like boil the ocean in, the, in this model. I want to be able to find and start doing continuous learning. So there's a whole different concept in regards to model versus platform. Well, that leads nicely into that next question, which I put up on the screen of the difference between edge intelligence and edge computing, which you've already kind of well, so I'll continue covered. and I'll continue with just a teeny bit more, and then and then and the boards obviously will 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 chime in. So the the challenge with today is we don't have specifications, and and so ESI right now is in is working with uh, Nvidia to start building out that those AI specifications within its ecosystem. So this will take ingestion tools, right? So edge intelligence, edge AI, okay? Or, and I, I, you have to be careful when you say edge, but it is what it is, right? We're gonna say point solutions at the edge on a camera uh, that, that incorporates some sensor capabilities and, and a sensor being a camera, could be you know sound detection, could be something that now correlates the event that you preconditioned. I'm, these are three or four things I'm worried about. I can't do much more than worry about those three or four things. 
but I can precondition that to evaluate the area that it's viewing and find there's a problem. Now, that sounds like analytics, but at the end of the day, it's not because there's additional capabilities now in terms of defining that information that is being processed. So it reduces potential false alarms in, in, if you use it appropriately. Again, you can only do a certain amount of, of, of models within that condition. Once you get into compute, it's a completely different model because now you have the power to generate or to maximize the capabilities of the video that's being processed at the edge environment. So now that's being processed, potentially going to an IDF and MDF closet, and now we're, we're actually taking that information and then moving it either into the cloud or on-prem to actually evaluate the data and start positioning you know, it, this continuous learning model, the training model the video ingestion uh, libraries that are qu required to start growing the potential cases that could exist that you're concerned about, right? And, and those change based upon conditions, potentially, you know, or, 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 or you know, say, you know, if you have certain situations that have, that have changed in your environment, they can be conditioned to learn those problems. So, it is about process power. It's about capability, but it's also about learning and, and the, the availability of that data to learn that information. So, Boris, I don't want to go too deep because then we're going to go right into the, the hole of, 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 uh, of truly uh, going into that, that uh, mechanical side of, uh, of AI. Oh, you said it extremely well. Uh, I, I agree with you. It's all about constraints. On the uh, camera, is is that big. Can't really see it, but it's not it's not gigantic. So there's a certain amount of compute that can go go in there. So obviously, what you want is you want to have some sort of specializations. You want to have the the minimum that can go in there in order to do the job. When you can have a, a compute a little bit on the side, and some people do it even on, in the cloud, you have a lot more. Uh, you have a lot more compute, you have a lot more servers that you can play with. So it's a different ball game altogether. The, the advantage for the edge, though, to put everything in the camera is it scales a lot better. And it's also a little bit cheaper because you don't have to pay for those extra servers, either on, on the edge or in the cloud, even worse. So it's all about a trade-off. It's really all about what you're trying to achieve. Um, if you want to have that continuous learning, which will involve a lot more powerful model you it's better to have that not on the camera but probably on on the you know on a server somewhere however if you want to have if you know exactly what you're looking for and you want just want to get the things done camera is your best option so application specific exactly yeah very good um so okay we can start to move into some uh, specifics and applications in the security industry. Um, some of this knowledge that you've shared and how this applies. Uh, why don't you keep going, Boris? Sure, um, I, I can definitely start and see. I'm sure you will have a lot of experience that he can share. Um, so in the beginning, we know when the first analytics came along, it was all about detections, intrusions. Uh, as there are people that are not supposed to be there. And it pretty much do, does a very good job at this. So the best AI in the world will detect with a 90 something percent accuracy that the person is there. It doesn't matter if it's raining, if it's dark, stay, any kind of locations, weather, doesn't matter. That's the primary reason why you want to have some analytics. Then you want to have a little bit more involved. You want to have some anything that is some sort of anomalies. You have, and we, we were talking about, you know, um, loitering in uh, in supermarkets, crowd formings in in crowded environments. Um, sensor information. Crowd. Sorry. Sensor information Absolutely. other than a camera, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, guns as well in schools environments. You absolutely don't want to see a gun there for obvious reasons. Uh, so any kind of threat that can be raised up to the operator and then take actions. We don't want to create analytics just for the sake of creating analytics. It's always 
action oriented, whether it's to send the, an agent uh, or the police uh, on on the site, or it's just to pre to to call the key holder. Those are the main applications that we can find. But I forgot a lot. You know, there's fire detections. There is uh, any kind of you know animals line crossing, all that, all that kind of stuff. Okay, do you wanna? Yes, no, and, and I probably missed. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. We're we're dealing with a lot of these type of environments because we are dealing with, say, Nvidia's ecosystem, who've created models, right, for specific situations. Could be traffic, ITS solutions. Could be um, banking solutions. Could be healthcare. Uh, you know, could be now these all these solutions are in need of ingestion tools. So let's 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 peel back the onion. Let's get down to the brass tacks. At the end of the day. Right, the use of AI will improve your ability to detect, deter, and defend your clients. We'll also be able to put you in a proactive security posture in regards to detecting and immediately evaluating scenarios. So I'll give you an example. If you are in a position where you have a loitering issue in an ATM vestibule, you at this point Normally, you have analytics and you can view the field and you know there are specific situations where a person will be walking through and, and going to an ATM and going in with a card read and all of this stuff is detected. And you know if there's going to be piggybacking, tailgating, you're going to get that information by base analytics. But what you won't be able to do is determine if there's by using a sensor sensor fusion and tying this to your 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 in effect your informational infrastructure for for ai that you will find trends you'll find potential cha changes historical changes that immediately are detected based upon the fact that you're taking that information and putting them into an algorithm that's being able to define certain circumstances traffic flow people flow etc cetera, etc cetera person laying down in a vestibule, breathing, but not being seen. These are things where you can get present sensing as tied to the, to the ingestion tool, all of which right now can be done mechanically through the process of, of analytics. But when you start layering in AI modeling, you start getting much more data, much more precise data and predictive data, which starts giving you some analysis, which right. you couldn't do before, because that was done usually by a human being and it took a hell of a long time. This supports guard force services, guard, you know, so if you think about information, what's the challenge for, for anyone in the integration world as well as the, the, the guard force management world? The, the point is that I don't have enough information and I can't make good decisions. So that's the beauty of AI because what it does is it allows you to gain reflective information from a, a, a large database and using sensors you can now predict and, pre and prevent potential instances that you never could have done before without having somebody watching a camera 24-7, which never is going to happen, right? So those days are over. and They never were available. Now they're really clear it's not possible. In a real-world example, let's say in healthcare, um, a, a common issue is trying to keep people from getting out of bed, right, in a hospital room. And so... AI is going to really help in that area to predict when somebody is about to try to get out of bed so Correct. that the uh, staff can respond and uh, either talk to them or go visit them, et cetera. And, also, technology, and technology is also adopting, adapting to that data field. So in, in the past, we created technology to, uh, we'll say, products to inevitably reach a point where they led. AI is now leading and technology is becoming more available to solving the problem as ingestion to that AI. Excellent. Yeah, you were talking about the healthcare uh, space. One of the big um, issue as well is fall detection. When a patient is falling, exactly. you want to have that understanding and be able to, to you know, create an incident for for a for nurse to, to come and help there's also an, we, we've been talking a lot about incident management and real-time response which is extremely important in our industry but there's another part that is also quite quite important and ai can have a a lot of impact 
is on any kind of post-processing or investigations. The thing happens, it's there, it's in the past. Now we want to go and get the information in order to recreate the story and to track different actors that led to that incident. That, if you think about it, without any sort of tools, it will take hours. Because what you will do is you will get all the sensors, you will get all the videos, and you will go back and forth and try to understand what's going on. With some AI capabilities, now you can do all that job in five minutes, which is a game changer. And there's a lot of companies that are doing things like that. So that's also a great forensic tool as well. Forensic makes the, tool. Yeah, as opposed to the old days of let's rewind the time lapse videotape and see if we can find the incident. I'll come back <laughs> to you in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's move on. Um, and uh, so some of the best practices uh, for deploying AI within a specific environment. And I know it's very, like we said, you've always said many times, it's very application specific, but high level, what are some of the best practices? So I'm gonna I'm gonna add one thing that's really critical in this is uh, truly understanding the reason for the use of AI and the use of the model. Part of the challenge is that we don't really understand sometimes why we do things, right? We just go ahead headlong and using technology. So what I always ask our customers, and I always say, look, let's assess the circumstances that you're you're in. Let's unpeel the onion from the core out, because that's really how you develop a true model. So it's not about the surface issues, it's about the problem, right? What is the outcome? So you start with the outcome. You start, what, is the, what, is the, what, what are you trying to solve? Then you start unpeeling it from the inside out. Because the, 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 the challenge is that we're so, as security people in the industry for so long, we've, lear we've learned to go from the outside in and then get to, the, to, to solve the problem through technology, through people, through process. AI doesn't work that way. AI basically says, what the hell is the outcome? And how do you build out the de design to allow you to solve it? Because if you don't do it that way, you're simply spending and wasting money, right? So, so this is really tying back to design, right? And say, based on the CIS format, let's design the ingestion is necessary for the outcome. So what are the ingestion sensors that are required? Cameras, sensors, whatever the case may be, your compute environment, what, if, you're, if it's okay to do a point solution because you really don't need the power, we just need to solve specific problems, it's a different category. The reality is that is, for the most part, how you start. Because without starting there, you are going to throw money away for no specific reason because you don't really know how you're solving the, out, the what the outcome really is. I fully agree with you, Pierre. Um, it's so much better to start with the problem and to work backwards on which technology to use to solve that problem rather than just say, I want AI and let me see what it can do for me. Um, I fully support this. And, and whenever we work with a customer, we always try to understand where they're coming from, what they're trying to achieve, what the problems, what the limitations. And only then we talk about AI if we need to talk about AI and not first and foremost on the first slide. And, and what's, what's actually fascinating, because I've worked with uh, Andrew over there at Motorola, where you know, we, we actually, you know, from the A&E perspective, and we look at certain companies, right? So companies who have created, in effect, unification to a certain degree and building the modeling based upon technology that exists, and then taking on and saying, okay, we're gonna solve these problems, these outcomes, the, the challenges that we have, and what are the outcomes, and then we're going to take a look at what exists in our domain, what technology already exists. And then let's maximize that capability so that it doesn't sit there so we're not replicating the same things over and over again. And this eliminates potential crossover budgets it, 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 in terms of design by, by intelligent design. You have clarity in regards to that design. You're not you know, really just throwing things, you know, into a pot and hoping that you're going to get the results you're looking for. So we always say this, right? Security has to tie to business process. It has to. You have to really understand that, you know, if you take an hourglass, the bottom of the hourglass is security, the top of it is risk. 
the middle is the is the choke point. The challenge for almost 50 years in, in, in IT and, in, and now physical security is the fact that we tried to solve our problems because at the end of the day, in the security element, without really tying these to, 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 to the business problem. While all the infrastructure, meaning every bit of technology is sitting in that bottom layer of security, IT, OT, IIoT, physical security, it doesn't matter. It all sits at the bottom of that, of that hourglass. So the key is the human being, what do they do? They, they touch that environment, they create threats and vulnerabilities. So we have been so wonderful at patching the problem, right? Oh God, there's a problem. So then I'm gonna add more technology. The challenge is we never really understood that if we don't tie this to, to, to the business problem, we don't tie it to risk. So therefore we can't tie it to liability. Therefore, there's no money and budget and opportunity to solve that problem. We're just simply band-aiding an existing problem over and over and over again. AI allows you to understand how these, these, uh, these critical components are tied to business processes because you're asking the right questions. You're asking what the outcome is. And then you're supposed to ask even more questions to finally get to a real answer rather than just a topper, you know, a top line answer saying, well, it solves that, you know, that that bum that walks into an ATM vestibule. Well, that's that's great, but what's the real reason you want to prevent that from happening? And it's not because of the bum, it's because of the guy who's hacking into the ATM that you didn't know about, or bringing in another person who by uh, at gunpoint that's that's going to that's going to take the person's money. So these are all things we have to be become aware of. This is what's going to empower the audience to become to use AI appropriately. Excellent, excellent. Um, ready to move on? You guys are doing great, by the way. Um, and I'll uh, remind uh, our um, people that are uh, viewing if they want to put a question in the chat, feel free to do that. We can address it at the end as well. So. Uh, the question about safety, you've already kind of covered that, but uh, maybe you want to take a little deeper dive. I mean, Pierre said said it very, very well in the beginning of the presentation. And uh, to to be f like, if you want to be fair to that topic, we would probably need another hour. Mm -hmm. to, um, <laughs> but I, I would just say one one thing that is probably different to what we has been already said. Um, sometimes. Uh, AI can lead to false positives and false negatives, and 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 sometimes those those events can, you know, you you miss that person with a gun, or you missed uh, that person that was not supposed to be there. And as with the human eye, it's no apparent reasons, and that we 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 even call it hallucinations. You know, sometimes. The, the the model will hallucinate something out of thin air and 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 it's all because it's it's all about probability like the 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 software was not confident enough to get that person so uh, in motola we're very very much aware of this phenomenon and that they, they can happen and there are different things that we can try to prevent that from happening Number one, we always bias the model towards showing the thing. Even if there will be some false alarms, that's okay. As long as we don't miss this. Second, we give ourselves multiple chances to detect the thing. So let's say if, uh, if your team are in uh, a, a site down in, you know, in, in a warehouse and you're absolutely not supposed to be there. Well, chances are that you're going to go through a uh, in front of a camera for more than one second. You know, just walk around and 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 the camera will see you for let's say three or four seconds. In those three or four seconds, the AI will have the chance to get you at least fifteen times. So, fifteen times in a row, we will have to miss you. Is a Big, big deal. It's like the, the chances of missing you is a lot less than if we only have one chance. So we put a lot of engineering and, and mechanism in place to make sure that we always get what we're supposed to get. 
and and that's why you can trust the AI. And but at the same time, that's also why you have some false false uh, false, uh, false alarms because we want to make sure that when we put a camera uh, in your warehouse, that camera is going to get what you're looking for. Um, so that that's what I wanted to say. There's a whole different you know about the cyber security aspects that Pierre touched on that is also extremely valid in that conversation. Yeah, and I think that that part is 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 maturing, right? As we're involved with NIST um, and CISA, um, our organization actually works in that field, right? We work testing models and testing solutions. We we actually have a, a lab in our office that just does that testing, right? So the evaluation. The key to this, at the end of the day, is. I think, you know, most importantly, as we talked about before, know what you're looking for, what you what you what you want to solve. Have an expert, you know, if it's if it's if it's a model company, if it's a VMS company, it, you know, and also a consultant who actually helps you. And I'm, I'm not to, tooting my own horn, but at the end of the day, sometimes you do need a third party perspective to really give you a clarity in regards to how to position this. From an integrator's perspective, if you're in, when you're doing this, the key is bringing it alongside the people and the stakeholders to really align how this affects everyone in the in the in the environment. So I always say that AI is very powerful. It can do a lot of things, or it can do nothing. It's all up to the user and the, the and the user's reality. So if the, if you have all the stakeholders in in the at the table and say, hey. I have all my stakeholders here. Let's we're we're planning to use AI to solve these specific problems. What problems do you see it can solve if we apply this? And all of a sudden you start getting into the real information about the company, the problems and challenges. Because at the end of the day, if it gains metrics, better metrics of where you are, where you stand, all of a sudden you're going to see cost savings in certain areas. Logistics, manufacturing, manufacturing lines. I mean, I'll just tell you that the, 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 it's limitless if you really look at it. But again, then that will distinguish between the type of AI you decide to use. And I think that that's really the most important piece of this, right? Where does it begin? Where does it land? What's the outcome? And understanding that that is a priority before you start spending money. And, um, and also from the trust perspective, one of the things you have to be aware of is privacy. Just understand what privacy constraints you have and how you're using AI to ensure that you're not obfuscating the uh, person's privilege to, to be private. And just understand consent is part of that. So all of this is something that has to permeate within your noodle. Those are good practices in general. I mean, for any type of video surveillance to have uh, consent if you're into a a private space, correct? Correct. And then the That's different, key. the different, uh, today, different laws. Yeah, today in, in Illinois, we have the BIPA Act. We have, you know, and again, there are changes taking place based upon technology. But in California, you have to be very cautious. New York State still got to be cautious. Uh, obviously, Canada and other countries are, are are even more in Europe, especially. So we have to understand that. The, the future is bright and it's it's going to take over the marketplace. I hate to tell you, but AI is not going away. This is going to be here forever. And that means technology must uh, adjust its direction for that reality. And it's it. And also to put one more point on there, I think uh, it's safe to say that when used properly in a security setting, it becomes a force multiplier. Um, Absolutely. Especially in a forensic setting, um, but also in a live setting that, uh, yeah, it's um, okay. Last question. Uh, and then we can get to some Q&A. So, and I think, uh, Boris, you've already mentioned this, and I think yeah. you made a very good case for why do you still have false alarms, but uh, any more uh, color or commentary on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, you have false alarms because we want to make sure we don't miss anything. But now the question is, how do we have less false alarms? Because it's not great, you know. Uh, I've asked for one alarm to show me an intrusions, and I get 34 of it. And and it all ties back to the conversation we had in the beginning. How do you want to deploy your models? If you have everything on the edge, 
then it's going to be more specialized, more constraints, but at the same time, more limited because the camera is only that big. If you want to have a, a more accurate and more performance solutions, we can have a we can uh, duplicate this with a, a server on the edge. If you want to have a tip, tip, top, we can even have a solution with a cloud. It all depends on how much the you know the the, the customers care about this, how much they want to create a simple slash more sophisticated infra infrastructure, and how much they're going to use it. Because if those alarms, you know, you have two types of scenarios. You have either one type where no one is watching it, and it's just in case there's an incident, and then we can go back to the insurance that exists, and that's legit. Or there is somebody actively looking at it, and if you have 50 alarms coming in, uh, it, the, 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 the agent cannot even do the, their job properly. And, and based on those two different scenarios, we have to understand what the customer is looking for and then have the appropriate response for this. So yes, the system, any system will have some false alarms, but there's a way to litigate this. Pierre, you want to- So I think you, can, I think you can lower the false alarm ratio correct. There's no such thing as, as perfect. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. I agree. But Six Sigma has always been, uh, always, always uh, a desire to achieve perfection but here's i'll tell you right now that i've seen it when we the use of platforms and the correlation of data what i call triangulation on target you have multiple data points that are coming in to validate and verify it's all about validating and verify a specific event the more you have the better you are right the better your your, your position to be successful the other part of it is is that continuous learning and the ability to actually get to that model, of course, compute allows you to do that. Now, if you're a monitoring company, if you are doing, you know, your your netwatch centric, mix these companies that are out there in the marketplace, they will use the ability to build out platforms that can ingest and now create a much clearer picture of the data field and be able to correlate the event so that it can define if this is a false alarm or not. So they have been able to get to that point where yes, the cost, the, the false alarm and, 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 and false positive has reduced, the noise has reduced, right? So it, 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 it's, 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 we're seeing that more and more. So this is a good thing. This is definitely a good thing. So I would say that we are gonna come to a point where false alarms will start falling unless, unless, you're you're really uh, have a point solution. You are expecting it to do all of this and more. I would just be very wary that look, you get what you pay for. We all know that, right? Everybody in the industry knows that you get what you pay for, and you can't expect more than it can actually accomplish. And you have to know what that 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 limitation is. Asking the right questions, being prepared to ask those right questions. Be educated about why you're using this will allow you to do that a little bit better. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I always like to, uh, one of my favorite books is uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And if, uh, if you apply seven habits, we covered several of them. Be proactive, <laughs> right? AI is going to be proactive. We begin with the end in mind. We put first things first. And uh, last, we sharpen the saw. It gets, it gets smarter and it gets better. So um, let's, uh, uh, David, you want pretty me to good, end Sam. I never thought about using that. That's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> I love it as well. <laughs> um, David, do you want me to uh, end the presentation um, and then uh, we can uh, go to some Q&A? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's make sure folks okay. have time to, to ask questions. And if, if we don't have any questions, I, I certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> So okay, uh, uh, yeah, if anybody would like to ask a question, we can uh, unmute you. Um, or they can unmute themselves. Or you can type it in the chat window, yeah. I, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say a comment. No question is a dumb question. This is a field that is very complicated. Uh, you have two people on the, uh, you know, that are speaking that do this all day long. So don't. I mean, trust me, I, I, the dumbest questions could be the smartest questions. So <laughs> it, it, I wouldn't fear anything that you ask. 
All right. I, I have a question. I'll, I'll I'll start this off, and then if if no one has one after this, then I'll have a follow up question. So, uh, in my previous life, I worked in the telecom industry, and specifically uh, on the software development kind of side of things. And, and we were all very tuned into something called the hype curve. Are you all familiar with that? Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. So, my question is: When you look at AI right now, this feels very much like a hype curve. But my gut tells me it's not <laughs> like like I think we may actually be underestimating what's going to happen. And when you're in the security industry, you don't have the luxury of using untested technology. Right. So you've got this you got what appears to be a hype curve with A.I. And logic would tell you, wait until the wait until the peak of the hype curve and then it, it'll come back down and even out into the actual application. But so, something tells me that A.I. doesn't really uh fit into a typical hype curve what what are your thoughts on that 100 percent agree I, it's not a hype curve at all because here's why so if you think about how we've approached things right for, for, for eons in terms of technology we've always looked at it from product centric to solve the, the the challenge and software was applied to make it easier today ai is is part of that software infrastructure that is actually controlling the product. Product, you okay, so when you t- take a look at a, a five sensor camera, right, with compute at the edge, a Hanwha camera would be a good example, or, or a Bosch, any solution, right? Mm. Is that a product or is that a software? It's not product, <laughs> it's software. Right. It, it doesn't matter the configuration and how you put together, because the reality is it could have been put together with five separate cameras and a computer above the ceiling, and all of a sudden you have the same thing. It's the software that's driving all of this. And the software we're talking about is the AI solution. The key to this is we're flipping, if you look at the CIS format, the CIS format for, for specification. If now we're saying, what is the outcome, right? What is the required outcome? What are the, the, the solution, the products or the ingestion tools? And I'm saying ingestion sensors required. So it could be camera, it could be, you know, whatever it's re- the bundle is to solve that, uh, to create that outcome. And then what is the wire diagram? What is the infrastructure? What is the compute requirements? What is all that? Put that together. Now you're solving that one problem. Guess what you've done? It's no longer based upon the product anymore because the product is just simply the outcome. I mean, it's the ingestion tool that's solving the outcome. So if this Think about what happens if the CIS, if we have an AI, an AI CIS format, just simply for AI. That's your airport. That's your landing field for all the different models. And when you create platforms and you build out seven different models under VMS, what does VMS become at the end of the day? A traffic cop. So the traffic cop has additions to the traffic cop, but now you have an AI ingestion environment that is specified. So now I need 12 specifications for to solve all my specific problems, and that's what I'm going to put into an RFP. Now I'm just simply I'm not asking for a VMS anymore because I get the VMS. I got a Genetech, I got a Milestone infrastructure, and this is nothing wrong with a what they're doing because they're going to end up adopting some of these models, which will include into their into their general spec. So the, this is just cataclysmically changing the way we look at things. Right. I agree with you completely. Depends on what you're talking about, AI. If you think AI as robots and, you know, end of the world, and that is hype. Not today, not tomorrow. No. Sorry. Maybe the day after, I don't know. But no, <laughs> not, not anytime soon. However, if you think about AI as solutions that can help, significantly improve the efficiency of a security uh, monitoring station or a uh, a security unit in the school, 100%. At Motorola and I'm sure other vendors, we sell millions, billions of units that solve those. those, those, uh, Yeah, and I I really call it, I call it synthetic cognition. That is really what I coined it in the last few years. I've written articles and added synthetic cognition. It's just synthetic thinking, right? That's all we're doing. We're not creating awareness. Awareness is not existing, non-existent at this point. We have another question. Um, so how do we evaluate where our current system design is 
in order to figure out what we need to uh, incorporate AI tools? And then how do we create a roadmap forward? <clears throat> So great question. I think that, that that actually typifies exactly the specification format. So we have to evaluate, first of all, our current environment in regards to what we are, t are trying to achieve from a security posture, right? And the only and the best way to do that is to evaluate what regulated and market regulated environment you are in, if there is any. If you're in critical infrastructure, what are the areas that you have to ensure technology is used for specifically to address that regulated environment? If your technology is very minimal in terms of maturity, in terms of solving those and are not modernized, then it's going to be very difficult for you to apply AI to solve those problems. If you have a, a modernized infrastructure to support compute and AI, and that means just being able to ingest that data or have that data field or capability, those, those, those sensors and that infrastructure that are capable, then you're good to go. If you don't, if you have cameras that are that you know, we'll just say you know, legacy driven, and I you can go through all the different types of variations of that. Analog being one, then you're probably not in position to become modernized and be able to take advantage of AI. And this is also where tech systems can help. Um, this is uh, where we are going to bring the right people in, uh, the subject matter experts and the right vendor partners to help you craft that roadmap. I agree. <laughs> we don't have any other questions in the chat. Any closing I've, thoughts? I've, 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 got, I've got one more because this, okay, I, may, I may not get these two guys uh, to ask questions to ever again. So we've been talking about AI and technology development for years now, right? It's 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 been going on, I'd say, for the, at least the past six years where we've been talking about the development of technology. Something has happened over the last year, and I can't put my finger on it, but what happened over the last year to all of a sudden GPU, make AI? GPU, GPU okay. capability. So NVIDIA and, and the ability to create the chips uh, and the GPU capabilities uh, in regards to Metropolis. Uh, we, went, we, we started out at Movidius, at Intel, in terms of GPU capability and neural network, which was a very small amount of capacity. And now we're moving, they moved into OpenVINO as a platform in, on terms of the Intel side and, and the CPU side. And then uh, NVIDIA created chip capability in terms of compute on the, on, on the GPU side, and that changed everything. So basically technology and the capabilities of technology was, was, was ready now to actually consume that data and that information and be able to now process what was required. So it's all about that. It has nothing to do. I don't care what kind of software you know, genius you have in the background. It all comes down to GPU and CPU, and uh, without it, and, and the and the capability on the on the on the chips to actually be able to to consume. Could, so FPGA creating that chip, chip set that was able to consume some of that data right at the edge, an ASIC chip from 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 Access. All of this is part of that equation. Uh, I agree gotcha. with everything you said. Yeah, um, I just say one story. Like no chat GPD that came in last year, November or two years ago. The technology to empower chat GPD is called Transformers, was available in 2016. It, it's just six years later that it, it it was enabled and empowered because of hardware accelerations. Because now you can fit gigantic models into some servers that you could not do it before. And same thing when we talk about AI, the same AI that I learned at school a long time ago, I, I, I look younger than I, I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> but, Alors, il est français, ça c'est pourquoi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's the same tools that we use today. It's just we have a Morris law, which is every every year or two, the 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 hardware gets multiplied by capabilities gets multiplied by two. Which means that now you can fit twice as a big model into one unit every two years. Yeah, and, and, the speed and gets I have a faster graph that and everything gets it's, and uh, I have cheaper. a graph. We've just done a, done a report on that. Taking Moore's law at 2.5 years, we've now moved that to 2.5 months. Every two months, 
We're changing. It's totally eliminating our, our viewpoint of Moore's Law now. It's crazy. So, David, you were talking about, or oh, we've been talking about AI for years. Let me tell you something. We're going to talk, talk about AI for years to come. I think it's a yeah, good me, place well, to it, put a bow it, on it, David. Yeah, I think I think what what it feels like is it's it's going to accelerate. That it's not a hype curve at all. That it'll actually exponentially uh, increase in terms of, of development. And it almost feels like if you don't get on board now, you're polishing the brass on the Titanic. You know, like it, like we really need to to catch up when it comes to this topic. So I, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Does anybody have any? So, you know, one of the things I want to just make sure as people understand is that it, it is not as complicated as you may think. It sounds very complicated. All the complications behind the apron, you guys don't have to worry about when you right. get to the to the end result. The key, however, is validating the companies you're working with. So the key is to ask the right questions. How many years have you been doing your, your modeling? It's been in the next last two, three years. Have you developed this? Um, are you funded as a company? Are you, you know, are, are you in a two-man in a garage environment? So we do evaluations on those ecosystems. The key is not being put in a position where you're, you're, you're buying into an AI model or a company that's just shown up in the last six months and has received $23 million in, 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 in funding, but truly is going to flip the company and sell it to someone else within the next six months, which is very dangerous for especially somebody in, 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 in an integrator's position who's now going to put this into a, say, critical infrastructure environment. So what we would want you to do is really ask the right questions. Ask them, uh, ask the, uh, have a set of cascading questions. We call it vendor qualification questions. And do it based upon compliance or regulation. If you're dealing with energy, you're dealing with healthcare, we do this a lot for companies because, frankly, it gets overwhelming. But we want, we want them to actually align with companies that actually are going to be around or have technology that is far more advanced in, in terms of their development. So you don't want somebody tinkering with your technology while you're buying it. Right. Excellent. Especially, especially in this industry. <laughs> especially in the security industry, and and so you don't want to buy. We call it used to call it vaporware. I I don't even call it vapor anywhere, anywhere anymore. I I call it uh, nowhere at the end of the day because you're really just buying stuff that that you know was was crafted by somebody who left Intel and has now somebody has a new business that he's just put a shingle up, and it's like that's great. That's not you know that's truly not a business. So. So we want you to really effectively ask those right questions, and we help you with that at ESI. We work with, I mean, honestly, look, we're, we're working with Motorola on, on a lot of their, 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 their direction in regards to, you know, A&E specifications and, and how to, to really enter the market the right way. They, they, they're, they're doing a great job with that. Boris, of course, doing, is heading that. Thank you. Excellent. We had one more question come in, Dave. Um, it's a simple one. What are the better camera models to use for this technology? If I answer this question, I might be biased. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You're free. No, we, I, we, I, I'm just going to talk about why I know, which is what we do. Uh, we, yeah. we, we, we developed some cameras here at Motorola that are specific um, for, for AI. And, and we've been acquired, acquiring different companies to have a wide spectrum of what you're looking for. If you want something in, a, in an airport, we've got you. If you want something in the school, we've got you. If you want something that uh, has thermal cameras, we can have it. The, re the most recent uh, acquisition we got was Sentinel, and that has a range of kilometers. So you can see kilometers ahead of you, and I have the ability to zoom in and zoom out and I'll have analytics on, on top of it. So it really depends on what you're looking for. Uh, that question cannot be answered without more context. <laughs> Happy to have a chat with you yeah. if you want. Excellent. That, that, that question came in from Ryan. Ryan, that, that might be a good question to ask your TSI rep if you ever get a chance to talk to him. Yeah, and, and the reality is, from my perspective, when I test 
against each other a lot of the different uh, cameras, I, I'm looking at all of those aspects and those models. So, you know, we're looking at the viability and capability. Um, you know, what it, what are they trying to accomplish? How far distance, you know, if it's, if it's for a, a railway station, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of different, you know, a, little, a lot of different factors to get to the right answer. All right, guys, we're at the top of the hour. We're five minutes over, actually. That was really, really informative. Thank you very much. I think the, the, the problem with this topic is you could, we could go down 10, 11 rabbit holes and talk all day about it. Um, but uh, you guys did a great job of, of summarizing some of the bigger questions here. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everybody who attended here today. We, are, uh, we did record this, and within the week, we're going to post it up on our YouTube channel, um, and we'll notify you via email when that goes up. We're also doing this again at 1 o'clock today, the exact same thing. Uh, conversation will probably vary if you want to join that, or if you think of questions uh, prior to that and you want to join, then then you're welcome to do so. There's no limit. So thanks again, and uh, thank you very much to Boris and to Pierre. Uh, you guys, uh, I'll see you in a couple hours, and everybody else, have a great day. Take care, guys. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye.